Music for this episode of About to Break is provided by Cat Beach Music. Whether you're looking to score an entire film or just need to find the perfect vibe for your next commercial project, our friends Bobby and Jen Hartree have what you're looking for. Check them out today at catbeachmusic.com. Hello, friends. I am recording this. If you're hearing my voice right now, this was recorded a couple weeks ago because for the last little while, Katie and I have been in the UK. And uh, and so obviously I'm recording this before we left, so I don't know how it's going, but I'm assuming it's going great and we're having a blast and we're seeing all the things. We're going to Dublin. I've never been to Ireland. I'm so stoked. We're going to Dublin and then we're going to Liverpool and then we're going to Edinburgh, Scotland and finally London. I'll be home in a few days uh, with some more exciting updates, but uh, we're going to continue our culinary adventure. Last week on the show, we had my my buddy Simon Majumdar on the show, and if you haven't listened to that, uh, take a listen. It's a fantastic conversation, and his story is just... It's amazing. It's always amazing to see the twists and turns that people go on in life before landing on something that they love, and that's his story. It's great. So go back and check that out. But I am, I am so delighted that this conversation took place. Uh, this conversation started in a unique way because three and a half years ago, Katie and I bought this wonderful little house in Upland. We love it. Uh, it's a city that most people that live in LA, when you say I live in Upland, they either say, where is that? Or that's in California. Um, but it's, yeah, we're just 35 miles east of LA. We found this amazing community and we met some amazing neighbors two of which are James and Liesl McConchy, and um, they've just become great friends and, and hands down the best neighbors that we've had. And uh, I'm so excited for the relationship we developed with them, which led to this conversation with Chef Charity George. If you've ever watched the show Nailed It on Netflix, you know, that's the show uh, based on kind of the Pinterest deal of people try to make a cake that a, that a real chef made and they fail miserably and um, the, this show is hilarious if you haven't seen it take a moment to go watch it our kids love this show and we have binged every episode so needless to say one day when we were hanging out with James and Liesl and Liesl mentioned that her sister Charity was the secret chef on, ne- on uh, the Netflix show Nailed It and the one who makes all the cakes that other people have to copy I was overjoyed that we got a chance to sit down and talk and uh, she's just a delightful a delightful amazing human they're they're filming right now and uh, I'm not allowed to talk about it I had to sign a little NDA it's a thing in the business uh, she was able to take us on set and we got to see what was going on but I can't talk about what was going on uh, but I can share with you this amazing conversation we recorded a few weeks ago I know you're gonna love it she's absolutely awesome and, uh, and really d- just deserves more credit than she's getting for the amazing work that she's doing. So get to know her because you're going to see a lot of her. She's absolutely an amazing human being and a wonderful chef and baker. And uh, I'm excited to introduce you to her. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode, episode 117 of the About to Break podcast, my conversation with Chef Charity George. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. Something is about to break. Hello, friends. Welcome to About to Break. I'm your host, Taylor Hughes, and this is the show where we talk to artists and entertainers who are just trying to do what they love and pay the bills in the process, break into the industry before it breaks them. I am delighted to have with us on the show right now uh, an amazing, incredibly talented chef and TV personality. It is Charity George, a.k.a. Chef Charity. Chef Charity, thanks for joining us. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really honored and, and thrilled that you are gracing me with being part of your podcast. I'm just excited. Oh, my God. We, we have been, uh, you know, folks will not know this till right now, but your sister, Liesl, and her husband, James, are some of our, our best neighbors in the in the neighborhood. They live right across the street from us. And we've talked about you for years now, and I'm so excited to talk to you. <laughs> I know, I, and I've heard about you and your fantastic podcast, and I've listened to a bunch of them. And I, so I'm again, I'm really honored to be part of this. And 
any friend of Lisa's is a friend of mine. Um, she's my favorite sister, and hopefully my other sisters aren't listening right now. But um, <laughs> yes, we 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 go by FS, which is favorite sister <laughs> an acronym, obviously. And um, so we think we're being incognito, but we're probably not. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, well, but yeah, probably probably not anymore. Once we put this out there, but. <laughs> That's okay. I uh my you know, sisters aren't, aren't much of podcast listeners, so I can like hope that maybe they're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is awesome. I, I've gotta tell you that um you know I this will be episode like I don't know, it's like a hundred and seventeen or something that we've done. Wow. And That's I, impressive. I, I well I only say that because there's been a handful that get me street credit with my kids and they are so excited <laughs> that you are on the show because <laughs> We we yeah. almost religiously watch nailed it. As soon as it comes out, awesome. we binge the whole thing. And yep. uh it, you know, it's it, when this when this episode comes out, the week before will have been uh Simon Majumdar, who's a chef and food critic, and um he does a lot of food network shows too. And so my 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 kids are like so stoked. They're like, Dad, do oh, you, that's so fun. Do we get to eat any food when you talk to them? <laughs> Well, I, I will tell you, um, we're actually filming right now in, in the area, in the L.A. area. And mm. so um, you can totally, uh, you can come be my um, my guest on set and, <gasps> and bring your kids. No. I've had so many kids. Oh, yeah. I've had so many kids through, like, the weekends are, we, we tease that I'm like a zoo animal on display because yeah. it's like tours that come through of all the Netflix execs and the production company people yeah. and all this and they everybody brings their kids because you know oh my off. goodness yeah so i will totally have you guys over to the <laughs> set and and the girls will just be and they'll meet jock and nicole oh and, my oh, god yeah, they'll, they'll lose their mind totally bring them my oh yeah my, it's so fun my 13 year old wants to be uh, a director and so she's obsessed with just Ooh. how things are made and uh and they both are, I love that our kids love to cook. I mean, you know, I'll walk in the house and I'll be like, oh, you're making Brussels sprouts again, huh? Like, <laughs> we, you know. so, that's funny. Oh, that's, well, that's. We have a fantastic director. I just adore him. He's a great guy. It's Steve um, Bernowitz. And yeah. um, he's, he and I actually met the first, like, I think it was my very first Halloween Wars, my very first production of any of the Wars shows. Yeah. And, um. <laughs> And he, he like he was super nice then, and he like made an impression on me then about how kind he was yeah. and like down to earth. And it was so fun to get to work with him again on you know so many um, episodes of Nailed It because I'm like because you know it's just it's like coming full circle because that was like ten years ago. That's so it was crazy. Now let's let's I go, know crazy. I, I want to get into all the TV stuff, but let's let's go back. When did cooking and baking become a thing for you? Was this something you did as a child? Or did it come come later in life? It was. Um, I think I was born with it. I used to, as a little toddler, grab the cubes of butter in the fridge and take bites out of them. <laughs> so my parents would see these. Yeah, they should have known then that I was seriously Julia Child based. Yeah. Um, they um, so I they would see little fingerprints in the in impressions in the side of the butter, and then they'd see my little teeth marks in the end. Oh my And goodness. of course. You know, I'm the oldest of six kids, so it was really only me that could have right. been the culprit. So, um, yeah, I wasn't very good at getting away with stuff then, but I got a lot better as I got older. Um, and uh, I I destroyed two Easy Bake Ovens as a kid because I kept trying to make things in them that you're not supposed to make in them. Yeah, because like the, um, the, the Easy Bake was like you'd buy like the little pouch of stuff, right? Like you just had to. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't much was mixing of ingredients. Those. <laughs> right so i would blow through those pouches in a hot second which you know is kind of the the, the hot the the easy bake oven version of netflix binge right is i would blow through those pockets in about an hour <laughs> um and then i had to come up with like my own stuff well you know that's cooking by light bulb right. so that didn't get me very far um so um then my my mom and my grandma um decided i guess it's probably time to teach her on the big oven yeah so she quit killing things and so um so they they started like teaching me stuff i tapped out their knowledge by about age 12 and wow. then because i'm a huge, huge bookworm i just hit the book so wow. i had my nose in every cookbook reading it from cover to cover not just like jumping into a recipe like most people do yeah um and i 
started like earning money and buying cookbooks and I and I mark in them like people think they're like sacred pages well, I have mine like highlighted scratched up you know like big sharpie marker and and to this day I do not try a recipe as written ever ever you know ne- I, I know I know so much food knowledge and I have so much food science under my belt that I I tweak it before I ever even try it that's great okay I can isn't that crazy? I know because yeah, I yeah. can read it and I can I know what's going to happen based on the the chemistry and the science and the taste involved, and yeah. I mess with it right off the bat. <laughs> terrible. That's no, that's it's amazing. Like I, I, <laughs> it's because you know you watch you watch people bake and you watch people cook and you think you know even especially these shows where you're having like celebrity judges taste things and you think, you know, maybe they're going to be surprised by it. But, but basically what you're saying is if they've got the food knowledge, they pretty much know what it's going to taste like and what it's going to, what it's going to do before they even start doing it. Well, pretty much really, really good pastry chefs know that stuff. I, um, I will say that, um, most savory chefs can't bake to save their lives. (laughs) And because, it, and they'll admit it too. Um, like when I first met Guy Fieri, he was like, Oh girl, what I bake, I burn. He goes, I can't bake anything. And, um, <laughs> and it, at first it shocked me. I was like, what? You're like so good. And right. he's like, no, no, no. He goes, I can throw stuff in a pan and throw flavors in there and mess with something. But he goes, when it comes to baking and all that chemistry and making sure things rise and do what they're supposed to do, he goes, I, I'm fish out of water. So but it's true. And I, I loved chemistry from a kid in high school. I was um, voted most likely to blow up the lab. <laughs> that, was the, that was the award I got at the end. What of a high moniker, school right? <laughs> I know. But, but what's cute is that um little like asterisk tidbits. I know, but um, my chemistry teacher, Miss Larvey, hi, Miss Larvey. Um, she was such a vibrant, exuberant teacher. And speaking of Lisa, my sister, who's gone into the field of education, and right. she's this kind of teacher. Like, she's the kind of teacher my, my chemistry teacher was. Like, just crazy fun. Like, she's your favorite teacher, hands down. Yeah. And so the, 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 the way she taught stuff, because I've gone into teaching pastry and stuff. I've taught it for years. And I teach like she taught. Like, mm. I, she was like my teaching mentor and my model. And I've kept in touch with her and told her, like I've kept in touch and told her how I, how much she influenced me basically, especially in my teaching style, because it's so fun. Like mm-hmm. she would literally like the first person in the front row, she'd grab their arm and she'd like do this tug of war back and forth. And she'd be like, I'm a molecule. They fight and they fight and the friction and the friction. And then she'd like let go of their arm, this big explosion. She goes, <laughs> well, they explode. And I mean, this that kind of like teaching and I do that kind of same stuff when I explain like, you know, the the meniscus, you know, as far right. as like um uh you know, measuring things in a liquid measure cup, yes. liquids in a liquid measure cup, go figure, versus trying to measure liquids in a dry measure cup and why that doesn't work and how it can mess up a recipe and blah blah blah. So yeah, anyway. Yeah, so no, I was gonna gonna say I I am uh, I am convinced that it's never the subject matter, it's never the topic, it's always the passion of the person teaching that gets other people into it. Right. You Absolutely know, true. Uh, you know, me, me Absolutely I, true. being a magician, like that's such a weird that everyone sees magic shows, but every now and then, you know, somebody performs in such a way or presents something in such a way that, you know, it's almost like contagious. Like a kid goes, I have to do this. I have to try it. Right. Right. Absolutely. So she, she was such a big influence on me, but then after high school, I, um, I was kind of debating, do I do, I I was really always into business and funny enough, like, um, back in the eighties, um, when, when, uh, Donald Trump was like this, this pinnacle of business and entrepreneurship and Like I had his, I had his freaking game. I had a board game. You had a Donald Donald Trump board game. I was a huge, yeah, I was a huge Donald (laughs) Trump fan because he was this big entrepreneur and I wanted to do that. And, um, I wanted to do something with regards to food. I didn't know him much about like personally, I just knew his business junk. So, um, this is kind of, I I laugh now, but anyway, um, (laughs) so it it kind of cracks me up. Right. But, um, 
So I went to culinary school. I went over in Europe. Um, I went to the Ritz Escoffier in Paris, which is actually um, a, a, a culinary school in the basement of the Ritz Carlton Hotel out there. The Ritz Escoffier, not Carlton, the Ritz Escoffier Hotel in Paris. And um, and being over there for three months and then putting pen to paper and really figuring out because this is before the internet, right? Um, only really Julia Child and Paul Prudhomme and, and, you know, were even around as far as like chefs anybody knew. Yeah, the, no the, the whole yet. like celebrity chef thing wasn't really oh yeah a no, thing. No I mean, among food, food critics, Renaissance, and, right? Right? Yes, yes, yes. There was nothing yet. I just still had my my own passion for food. So um, I was over there and I realized I was going to come out of culinary school over there after two years with a debt load of having a law degree, but not that kind of earning potential. (laughs) Right. I mean, it's true in that movie, Julie and Julia, like you're going to start off as, you know, not even a line cook. You're going to start off just prepping, you know, a 50 pound bag of onions and, um, you know, scaling things out for, for the executive chef or whatever. Like you're just a minion mm. and, and, you know, back then it was like five bucks an hour, maybe. I, right. I mean, I don't even remember what, what minimum wage was. Anyway, so I was like, this is stupid. I mean, I knew enough business wise that that was dumb. So I um, came back to the States and I always kept a foot in food um, in some way or another. Um, I even like at one point worked in the grocery industry for a while okay. as far as um, food brokerage firms. So they're like the middlemen between your manufacturers and your um, grocery store chain. Yeah. Um, but um, I mean, I did a stint in radio or the radio DJ was for it, um, a couple of years. And was that was it this was, because I, you wanted to try different things, or was this just the awareness of going? I love food, but I'm not paying the bills doing it. Right. It was more I love food, not paying the bills doing it. And I just I've I had this weird thing throughout my life of just the craziest opportunities literally jumping in my lap, and I'm like, oh, that sounds fun. Let's do that. Yeah. So. I was a radio DJ on a hip hop station. I became the promotions director for, um, for the hip hop station and the alternative radio station back then. This is like early nineties, mid nineties. Yeah. And, um, I did funny story. I did a, um, a promotion with MTV, um, for MTV spring break and sent some listeners down in an RV with one of our DJs down to Lake Havasu for spring break okay. with MTV. And, and that's where MTV from my radio promotion, that's where MTV got their idea for road rule. The show. What? Road rule. They asked. Yeah. I swear. They asked me if they, if I would mind if they used my, my radio promotion idea. Cause they've had a show idea based on it. I'm like, sure. I don't care. Whatever. <laughs> that's crazy. Six months later, road rules comes out and I call him like, I'm like, Stephanie, is that what you did with my thing? And she's like, yeah, do you like it? I'm like, like, Oh my gosh, that's so funny. You're like, so about that check. <laughs> I, I know, right? Yeah. So like, I need to, I need to figure out how to monetize more things like this. I just, I give away, I give away so much as it is right now. Probably, oh, I can't even put a dollar amount on. I know it's probably over a hundred thousand dollars, but um, I bring so many companies with me on set for Nailed It. Right. All the different products and things that you see on there, mm-hmm. almost all of them have come with me because I have relationships with those companies. Yeah, and when they, you know, when you take their products on Food Network and stuff like that, they take over their label. Right. Oh because yeah. If they're not, yeah, if they're not Food Network advertisers, the Food Network won't let their products be shown on on um, screen. Right. So Netflix doesn't have advertisers. They don't care, but right. you know, you just do trade out agreements. So basically for the cost of product, not even extra money, just the cost of product, they have their stuff all over the screen. Wow, and huge. Netflix has over a hundred, I think it's over 150 million subscribers versus the highest rated show I know of on food. Ne- food network is Halloween wars. And it's only on six weeks of the year. Right. And I, I think the highest um, ratings they've ever had was like seven to eight million for an episode, That's and, crazy. and you're looking at 150 million people. Right. So yeah, advertising well, and, wise, and let's it's let's be honest, crazy. that's 150 million people with a Netflix account and about 10 other people using their <laughs> password. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true oh my god it's so true and as they're like you know struggling to pay their their bills right now they're wishing that all those other people like you know, <laughs> right. had actual accounts so they right. could get their 12 dollars a month gosh yeah yeah but anyway so i so during my divorce um uh 13 well i guess it was now it was like 16 years ago total 15 years ago yeah um 
I, I went back to culinary school and finished my degree. And so I actually have a degree as a pastry chef finally. And, um, and went straight into just cake and custom cake at 16. I had my first custom cake job though. I was in high school and, um, I was working at a, uh, uh, like a formal dress wear place that's okay. still in my local mall, which is funny. Um, so I was working there and this is cute it, couple this came is in, in and San Diego area. Yeah. This is in San Diego. And, um, the cute couple came in and she was looking for a formal dress for some event. And I was chatting with them and helping her find a dress. And her husband was so nice too. And they literally hired me away from the dress place. Yeah. And I went to work in their custom, um, cake shop. So they do custom, you know, celebration cakes and wedding cakes and stuff like that. So for two years, I worked for them as I finished high school. And, um, and what's really cute is like four years ago, I was at a, I was at a trade show. I was demonstrating in one of, of these companies booths that I work with. And, and I look up and I see her badge before I see her face and the name and I flipped and I looked up, I'm like, Oh, it's actually you. Oh my gosh. And we were like crying and squealing <laughs> and Oh my gosh, it was so funny. It's like, I see you on TV all the time. It's so cool. It's so cute. So cute. So it's fun how you see things come full circle, right. but, um, but I, you know, I really, really wanted just a piece of paper. I don't, I can't say I learned much of anything in culinary school by that time, except for sugar work, which then I, you know, chose to specialize in. Um, well, in this, and, this is a, at a time where that, that <laughs> was, there was a lot of changes with sugar work, right? Like, I mean, oh, I, yeah. mean I mean, the stuff yep. that you see people do now, it, it's like the science behind it always existed but we didn't understand how you could use it or something like right well sugar like sugar sculptures and, and actual sugar work which is um it's actually isomalt it's uh it's it's sucrose that's been had two enzymes change you're getting into my teaching method here no do so it sucrose I love has it. had two two enzymes changed in it so that it doesn't attract moisture and get sticky um as much like it it will hold on much longer than just regular sugar and get sticky out in the air yeah. so we it's, it's like a diabetic sugar it's super low um glycemic and stuff like that so that's what we use when we make big sugar sculptures and pretty sugar pieces but like when you learn that kind of stuff over in europe and you're making these big elaborate gorgeous you know sugar sculptures i can't sell that right i don't have a market for that here right. i mean even 10 years ago when maybe you could sell some of those things like to a, um, a cruise ship or, you know, something like that. Nobody's buying that kind of stuff. Right. And so my thought though, was as I'm making cakes and there's various things that somebody wanted on a cake and I'm thinking, you know, really the, the thing that would make this look the most realistic, the most actual is sugar. So I started making stuff out of sugar to put on cakes. Well, that's, a snag in itself because there's a lot of moisture going on on a cake and right and that's like the enemy of sugar right? <laughs> sugar and, right so there's there's methods that i've you know figured out and used um you know and my mentors have helped me through and stuff like that as far as like making sure that sugar work stays okay on a cake yeah um but i i kind of pioneered the whole putting kinds of sugar work stuff on actual you know crazy ass cakes yeah. And, um, and since then there's tons and tons of people that have, you know, gotten into it. And, um, you know, with the Halloween wars kind of shows where they've added a sugar person, a cake person and a pu- pu- uh, pumpkin person all together, you know, they, they helped push that whole, mm. um, that whole thing along. So it's been, it's been kind of a fun evolution of, you know, that whole, it's just, I mean, cake in general. I mean, I remember first watching Ace of Cakes. Right. With Josh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I was like, Oh dude, these are fun, you know, and, and, and liking making stuff like that. I remember when we were um, I was at the custom cake shop when I was 16, we made, we had, um, the Tijuana bull fighting arena, whatever that is down there. They asked us to like recreate their arena in cake. <laughs> oh, wow. And that just right there, that sparked something in me like, Oh, that's so cool. So, like, and that, that's that so didn't... much better than just a stupid stacked cake right yeah that didn't throw you like Like you shot me off into all this rad stuff so you you heard about that like they say we want you to build a cake arena 
And and your attitude is immediately yes. You didn't freak out. You oh, didn't panic. Yes. You were just like, let's do this. Yes, I was like, oh, that's so fun. Yes, I totally <laughs> wanted to do that. And 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 since then, I mean, I'm still I'm such a sucker for that kind of stuff because I had um my airbrush mentor. Um, she had the idea. She was like, I think we should make a, a, a an all edible lava lamp. I'm like, oh, that'd be so <laughs> cool. Let's totally figure that out. Yeah. And so of course, it took us a few weeks of R and D how to figure out how to actually make the entire thing edible, including molecular gastronomy on the inside. And sure enough, we did it. And it's, oh my gosh, people do not believe it's a, it's an all edible lava lamp because it looks so real. It's the trip. I'll have to send you a picture. <laughs> it's so rad. It's so cool. Yeah. So stuff like that. I mean, to me, I have a really bad character flaw in that if it's challenging, if it hasn't been done, um, if people say it's impossible, I'm on it. Like, yeah. uh, sign me up. Has, I'm on it. Has, I want it. Has that always worked in your favor or has there ever been a moment where you like bit off more than you can chew and we're like, wh- what have I said yes to? Oh gosh. I've got, I do that all the time. Um, <laughs> And, and I, it just makes me dig in more and make it happen. You know, that the acronym MSH makes stuff happen. Right. <laughs> yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Um, um, that's, that's like my mantra. I, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, we had like our, I was telling you before my, I've got two boys that play water polo and we had at their high school, we had a scoreboard that, um, was literally burnt to a crisp. It was a giant 87,000 or $85,000 scoreboard that was charred like it was it looked like it had been charcoal did it did it just, it was just the electronics blow up or something like how did it how did it burn um it was i see that was the thing it took me two and a half years to get us the money to replace it to figure out and interview everybody that had anything ever to do with it to figure out why it burnt up so that the new one we would get one day right. wouldn't do the same thing so the um the coaches were always turning it off all the way so the fans wouldn't kick on to keep it cool on the big wall and it was in the sun twenty four seven. Yeah. Well, you know, whenever the sun was up. So um so it literally baked. I mean it literally cooked. They took the ambient temperature on the face of it. Um I just said the wrong word ambient, but the face of the temperature, surface temperature. They took the surface temperature of it during the day and it was like two hundred and sixty degrees. I'm like, I can bake something at that. Wow. Like no, no electronics are going to survive being cooked that right. way every yeah, yeah, day. Yeah. Right. So it literally fried. But anyway, so, um, when, uh, we had a, a water polo parent meeting and the coaches were like, we don't want to hear about the scoreboard. We've dealt with it for years. We hate it. We <laughs> don't just even ask with us it. about it. What are yeah, they doing? They just ask us about they're, it. They're like, we got whiteboards now. We ran on the whiteboards. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, how are they? I know it's terrible. I mean, we have like, we have the best, one of the best um, water polo um, teams in the whole county of San Diego. My 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 older son, you know, they won CIF and everything else. And here we have this burnt up, ugly scoreboard, and we have you know it's terrible. Anyway, so um, <laughs> so of course, you know, they say, "Don't ask us." What do I do? Like you know, the next week, I start asking them. I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> give me everything you know." And they're very sweet, so they like right. oblige me. And and um, you know, two and a half years later, we have a gorgeous new scoreboard up. And I got us a, an $87,000 grant from our lovely county supervisor's um, office. And we have all kinds of new equipment. We have this gigantic new mural along the wall because we couldn't have signage panels around the, around the board that blocks airflow. So that was one of the things we had to figure out. Wow. So instead, um, you know, we have a 105 by 100, no, 109 foot by 37 foot high gorgeous mural on the wall that that scoreboard was on i'm like well let's just paint the wall <laughs> <laughs> and they're painting the whole wall and um yeah so was, i mean that was a fun one that was one of those msh things where it's like you know we're just going to make this happen and even if it takes a long time because you know eighty seven thousand dollars is not a little drop in the hat so right. um <laughs> you know it's just stuff like that i just i'm all about a challenge i'm all about you know making stuff happen See, this, this is happen. this is what it, it comes down to i tell people especially in entertainment the ones that are doing it the ones that are doing the thing that everyone sits on the couch and goes man it'd be great to do that are the people who go and they get stuff done 
I hope you're enjoying this episode of the About to Break podcast. Three quick ways that you can help us out here at About to Break. The first one is to go on iTunes and leave us a review. Uh, If you enjoy the program, please leave us a five-star review. Big thank you to everyone who's already done that. If you haven't yet, please jump over to iTunes. You'll need your iTunes account information. Uh, But you can click on the podcast, leave us a five-star review. Just leave us a one or two-sentence little blurb there. Let people know what you like about it. That helps us out huge. Second way you can help us at about to break is by becoming a producer. Uh, Our goal is to have a thousand people given at least a buck a month to help offset the cost of producing these shows and it does take time and uh, it is a passion project i will continue putting these out for free because i think it's a helpful conversation Uh, but anything you can do to help us out by producing the show would be awesome go over to about to break podcast.com click on become a producer and see what that's all about last thing that you can do and this one is also a real a real simple way of making a difference is just sharing the podcast all right when you see it out there on social media on instagram facebook Uh, Go ahead and follow along and then share it with your friends. Let someone else know how much you liked it because it sure does make a difference. All right, back to the program. It's okay to look and to go like, wow, I wish I was doing something like that. But it's, you know, you say you've had all these opportunities and and I'm a firm believer that opportunities are happening every day, but so many people just won't say yes to them when they come up. Right. So true. So how, how did that... I mean, so so now you're you're you've become a pastry chef. You you've got young kids. You're recently divorced. When did the TV thing become an idea, or like was that always a plan? Like I'd love to do TV stuff as well. How did how in the world did you end up baking for TV? Well, that's funny you should ask. So right out of um, when I finally got my degree, right out of uh, culinary school in San Diego, I went to work for a gal that had been on Food Network Challenge twice. Okay. The only person then in San Diego that had been on that show. And it was kind of the only cake show as far as a a competition show at the time. And and she'd won like silver both times. So I was like, okay, I want to go to work for her because she was doing crazy cakes like I like and, you know, the cool stuff I like to do. So I went to work for her and... God love her, but she was a hot mess and she <laughs> lost her business and, um, very sweet lady, but just a hot mess. But, um, so she lost her business and well, and this, um, this again I, comes down to, you know, having the business savvy too, not just yeah, being great oh with gosh. your, you know, you, yeah, it's so important. It's so tough to do too, especially as a creative, you're like, Oh, I don't want to sit down and do the left brain junk. I yep. just want to stick with my right brain junk, Yep. but you have to, you've got to learn how to do both. If you're going to succeed, otherwise you better make enough money to pay a whole lot of people to do it right. for you and you better trust them. Yeah, so, that's true. um, yeah, I know that's a tough one too. Um, so anyway, so I, um, the people that bought her business, um, I went to work for them and, um, about six months in working for them, um, Ultimate Cake Off had started on TLC, and um, this and is, this they was called. like this was like nine, ten years ago, something around there. Yeah, it was a long time ago, and so they they had seen my stuff online, which was that was also brand new, was posting your stuff online, <laughs> right? And um, so they had seen my stuff online, and they contacted me. And they said, "Hey, we're looking to cast our second season of Ultimate Cake Off." Blah blah blah, and I'm like, "Oh, cool, how fun!" And so I went and did that show. Well, they liked us so much because how to explain this. So my uncle owns um, uh, five star military vehicles in, and he uh, rents out military vehicles and has for, Oh gosh, 30 plus years. Okay. Um, maybe four, maybe 40 years. Um, so he rents out uh, military he, vehicles to the entertainment industry. He just has he just has like tanks and jeeps and stuff. And he oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. And so yeah, I know it's crazy. And he's always been an enthusiast, and he's very good at that stuff. And so he's rented them out to the studios, and he's here in Huntington Beach. And um, he uh, he was desperate for some drivers, and he had taught me how to drive these things. <laughs> and so he was the one that got me out of radio and I moved um, from uh, Utah and Salt Lake where I was in radio and I moved down to Huntington Beach and lived with him and worked for him for a couple of years. So I like, you know, did the, the 
drunk driving and the, you know, the other just regular driving of these vehicles and a whole bunch of movies and music videos. Like I did the California love video with Tupac and Dr. Dre. I mean, what? You know, I've done all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Sergeant Bilko with um, Phil Hartman, Dan <laughs> yes. Aykroyd and Steve Martin. What? I mean, Steve That's Martin amazing. taught me rope tricks. I know. Are you serious? I, yeah, it's so fun. So I, yeah, Dan Aykroyd hit on me. That was, that was ugly. Um, but anyway, so no. it, um, that was gross. But anyway, um, highs so and lows, highs and it lows. I see, I know, right? It's true. So, me too, me too. Um, so, um, you got to learn how to stick up for yourself, girl. Yes. Um, so, I, I've seen the back end. I know what goes into, into a production. I've been on, you know, four month long feature film production. Right. So I knew all the back end of production. So when I go on my first time ever to be a contestant on these shows, you, you understand um, what takeoff. Yep. Yes, I get it. And what? I know that they're there to make good TV. Right. And so I'm like making friends with all the camera guys and the sound guys yep. and, you know, and, and making sure that I, you know, meet and get to know the executive producers and I'm just getting to know the crew because that's kind of like my comfort zone anyway. Right. And so, you know, and, and I'm calling the camera guys by name when I'm asking them to like step aside for a sec for me so I can get around the table or whatever. Cause I'm like, I get that you're trying to get your shots, but I, I need to get past your buddy. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I instant because, because TV food production, um, is a very small world and you know there's a huge interchanging of all of the different um back-end production people right. they just go from one food show to the next it's a very small community and so i got a reputation instantly hmm. of being the easiest person to work with that's so the I thing just kept getting called back yeah Charity, i just that... kept getting and, and that i make good stuff obviously, right but yeah I, but that i that i'm the easiest person to work with at one point on that first show, I had the jib, which is the big, huge camera yep. crane over my head. I had three other cameras in my face, and I literally had one up underneath me. The guy yeah. was like on the floor underneath me, and I'm <laughs> in the last five minutes of the show. You know, we were giving them all their drama because we just couldn't get this chocolate to temper again to get yeah. our last champagne glass on that cake. And my, my, one of my assistant guys is like, I can't get it to temper. I'm like, get me new chocolate. He's like, you can't temper chocolate in five minutes. I'm like, watch me. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I did. Cause I was like one of those MSH moments. Right. And, um, and we got it up there, but with all those camera guys, I was like literally getting claustrophobic and right. I don't get claustrophobic. Right. But I had, I just took a half sec and I said, guys, I know you need to get your shots, but I need you to just take a step back for me so I can work. And yeah. they were like, they were so shocked, yeah. so shocked that I said it like that. And I, and I was so nice. Like, oh, okay, cool, cool. So they backed up for me. Yep. They did it. And it was, it was that kind of like in the intense, crazy adrenaline pumping moment that right. I took a second, you know, stepped out of my contestant mode, stepped into their mode and said, guys, I just need to just step back for a second. Yeah. And oh, yeah. And it was, it was like end of the story. And so I, 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 I lost count. Honestly, I think I had done 11 or 12 shows between TLC and food network before I ever did anything with Netflix. Wow. And I turned down probably three times that many wow. shows that I got called for See? because I, either they were like dumb or I was like, <laughs> no, that's not going to make me look good. Like, or, you know, I mean, whatever this it week was, on like, food no. zombies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although the food zombie thing would probably get me in because I love my Halloween stuff. But <laughs> I, yeah, but there was just a lot of like not so great productions out there. And so right. I turned down a good three times what I did. See, uh, people need to understand this too. So much of being on set is just being cool and doing the job mm -hmm. and, you know, you say, like, obviously, you have to have the talent. Like, at the end of the day, if you're hired to play guitar, you have to be able to play guitar. But, right. but yeah. mo people forget that in this business, so much of the time on set is spent with these people that you want to work with people you want to hang out with. Like, you don't want right. to work with someone who's who's a pain and, you know, who's super needy. It's just like, come in, do your job, understand what everyone else's job is, and, like, serve the project. Right. Like I, I overheard, we did a Netflix function the other day because we've actually put one of our, um, what I, I chuckle saying this. I can't even say it with a straight face. 
we've actually um, submitted one of our episodes for an Emmy. That's <laughs> rad. What's you know what, what mean? category? I don't hear it without laughing. I'm like, are you kidding me? Well, but, no, um, that's so rad. Netflix did this. I know it's so rad. But and we've been up for a critic, a TV Critics Choice Award twice now, and we didn't win yet. But what's okay. what's what's the Emmy? What's the Emmy category? Um, I think it's reality. Okay. I think it's reality TV. Yeah. I gotta look it up. But it was so we um Netflix asked me and my gal to come um put on a live mail the event at their big um their big event about all the different shows that they were submitting for Emmy Awards. Okay. And so we put on this huge live mail the event where um Anthony from Queer Eye yep. was one of the contestants and Samine from Salt Heat Salt, Fat, Acid Heat, I remember how what, oh, yeah, what yeah, order yeah, she yeah. does it in. Right. But um she was one of the contestants and then we pulled somebody out of the audience, which was the other contestant. So we did this live thing in front of press and, um, and it was, it was super, super fun. But, um, I overheard a bunch of, um, and I won't mention any names, right. but like yeah. John Favreau was there and stuff. Cause he was, you know, they've submitted something for his food stuff for Netflix. And so it was fun to see, to see him, I actually used to like dance with him at the Brown Derby in in, are you, um, are in Hollywood. You, are you yeah, serious? Right, right when they, I know, right when they, um, when they released, he and uh, Vince Vaughn used to dance with both of them because um, they had just released Swingers, so Swingers, they were yeah. still kind of like nobodies, you know. I mean, oh my god, yeah. This is, I think, the only thing before fire. that. What did he do? PCU or something like that? Right before that, something like that. Yeah, I didn't. You know, until they had like done their Swingers thing, I didn't really know who they were. But anyway, so it was kind of funny. But it's funny he was there too. So, um, so we did this, and I overheard the whole glam squad, which is people's like wardrobe and makeup right. and hair people. I overheard them talking about this one star. I don't mention any names, but um, <laughs> about how they're always like hours late, and they were really concerned about getting them ready yeah. in time when they're hours and hours late. And I was mortified. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, shoot me in the head if anybody ever says anything like that about me yeah like never right yeah. and so you do you get a reputation fast based yeah. on your actions yeah. right you get and, a reputation fast and so and you've you, got to be careful yep yeah, and your reputation can change in an instant you know for the negative oh, yeah, for so sure. for sure well, like you, when, when and i'll be honest when i've got producers like breathing down my neck you know uh and they want to make changes to my stuff i nailed it and whatnot i you know, I have to push back sometimes because it's just not possible in the time frame. Or, you know, I know it's just like them having like a, a little creative bee in their bum and they think, oh, maybe this would be cool. And I'm like, no, we, I can't <sighs> do it. Yeah, you know, we can't get it done and still have it on set, you know, in right. time for the episode. Yep. And so I do have to be like a bully sometimes, not a bully, but like a brat sometimes and say no. I have to, you know, I can't just be, I can't be your yes man right now. I have to push back yeah. on you and say no. And I hate doing it, but it's like survival. Right. For me well, and it's, and because it's, the show's awful to make because of what I'm required to do. And, you know, I just, I have to say no sometimes. Yeah. Well, t take us through a little <laughs> bit because you, you're really, I mean, <laughs> I kind of look at it, you're kind of like the Wizard of Oz of this show because, you know, when you, when you see when you see the show on TV, you see these creations, and then they've got you know Jacques and some other people talking about the creations. But you're the one who's actually behind the scenes making all of this stuff. What it right? I did not expect when I first got called to do this, and I got called to do this by a producer guy who um, one of the very few people I actually trusted in the business. Um, Wait, you don't trust people? He called why, me. Why? Why? Oh why wouldn't gosh. you trust everyone in this business, Charity? Are you I... kidding me right now? <laughs> people lie through their teeth. Oh, awful! Right. And I'm a straight shooter. Right. I am like, what you see is what you get. I'm not gonna blow smoke up your bum. I, I, right. I, I, I say it like it is. Right. And although I have a filter, I'm nice. Yeah. But um, well, people uh, can't like, tell you you. We, you can you can say it like it is in a way that's on behalf of everybody, and people get like you're right. not being a jerk. Like you get what we're yeah. trying to do. So, right, exactly. Yes, I'm. I'm very diplomatic. Um, heck, I'm a mom, you know, so right. I, I can go mom <laughs> mode on people. Right, lots you know, of training. Times, but, 
Yeah, so I know, and like, you know, how to like kind of discipline and, you know, be be nice, but, you know, get your, get your stuff across. But anyway, so, um, so the guy that called me for this in the first place when they first had the idea for the show, he called me and honestly, I'd had such a bad experience the last um, show I had done with the company he was with previously Okay. that um, I, I saw his name on my phone screen and I was, I debated whether to even pick it up hmm. and it rang and it rang. And even when my kids saw it, they're like, are you even going to pick that up? Because they know, <laughs> you know, they know all this awful stuff in the background. And I said, I don't know. And, and one of my kids goes, well, you could just say no. Right. You know, you might as well hear what he has to say. Yeah, and that's, I'm like, oh, that's fine. great. That's good. Right. So, you know, this one of my, you know, when your teenagers have a little wisdom once in a while. So anyway, so I picked it up and before I even said hello, he goes, first of all, thank you for answering. <laughs> <laughs> he knew, he, he knew what was up. He knew. And he goes, and before you hang up on me, this is for Netflix. I'm like, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the not food network. And so I'm like, I'm listening. Yeah. Um, and so then he proceeded to tell me about, you know, the show idea and who was doing it. The production company that makes, um, nailed it is the same people that do Project Runway and Top Chef. Okay. So they've won Emmys for their shows. Right. And they so you, are, you know, it's of a, legit. Cer- it's a certain quality yeah, and they know what they're doing. Yeah. Yep. They know what they're doing. So I was like, okay, you know, so it's sounding a little better and a little better. And he told me the whole like idea of the show was based on, you know, how people were trying things off Pinterest and doing epic fails and they were being funny and, and posting side by side, right. you know, saying, nailed it, you know, when they totally sucked at it. Right, right. And, I, and which has been, you know, it's been a really funny thing people were posting for quite some time. And I'm like, oh, that's so fun. And he's like, well, I want you to come. He goes, we have this idea of what they called secret chef. Okay. And so he said, um, you know, you'd be on camera making all these things so that we see the process. We want the education element in there. Right. Which is and, big, which is big you know, for you. know what they're supposed to do. And of course they hit me with, you know, they, they, they pulled at my heartstring with the education. Element. Right. I was oh, like, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And, um, they probably brought up said, science, um, food science at some point. Right. <laughs> yes. I know. Yeah. He's like, so people will understand how they're supposed to do it. And, um, and he said, and then at the end, we'll reveal you, and it'll be, oh, surprise, this is who's been making it. Well, that clear, anybody who's watched the show, clearly that has not, that didn't happen. We did film it. Right. That's the thing that pisses me off. We oh, did you, film it. you filmed the package. We filmed, you, you we did that filmed the reveal. Segment. Yeah. Yes, we filmed it. Didn't happen. It did not air. And this, um, this was for know. the very first. Somebody in post, yeah, somebody in post production decided that, no, we're not adding that in there. So, um, but I also, even though I filled out all the paperwork, I didn't get screen credit either, which like pissed me off. So when they called me, um, it was really funny when, when I was watching, when, when Netflix first sent out the trailer, so basically I became like a glorified hand model is what I did because mm. they only filmed my hands and that's all you see through the whole thing. And then it's Jacques voiceover like you said right and so it seems like it's jock doing it well there's a ton of chatter online about whose hands are those right. like those are clearly not jock's hands right and and clearly and, people know jock doesn't do this kind of right stuff. He's, he's a he's a chocolatier, right? chocolatier yeah and he doesn't do all this american goofy cake junk yeah. and and it's very, very different than anything European, obviously. Right. But, well, and, um, and and he is so, he is brilliant, brilliant at what he does. I would laughed. I forget what episode was. Maybe they were making a unicorn horn, and and he <laughs> like on camera was showing how to do it. And I'm like, that doesn't look anything like the one charity made. <laughs> yeah, I know. The poor thing. Those are those are what we call WWJDs. Is what would Jock do? <laughs> and that was like another another little moment that we like to add in the show is Jock. You know. Because those, unlike other um, shows, our judges and hosts, you know, they sit there at that table the entire time. Really? They actually, yes, they actually sit there and watch the whole thing in real time. So there's a lot of, like, talk back and forth between, right. you know, everybody there. And, and so it's kind of like a, a time filler. Is yep. what, and, and we've used it, you know, like, this is, so Jacques, like, has the host. Nicole and our guest judge, like he walks them through like how to do something. Yeah. And so, um, but yeah, poor, poor Jacques, I have to teach him a lot of those things because he doesn't do our goofy American stuff. Right. So he and I, he, you know, he and I are dear sweet friends. I just adore him and his wife. And, um, 
they just had their little second, a second kid. And they're just adorable people. And, but I feel bad for him because nobody wants to look stupid on camera. Nobody no. wants to look like they don't know what they're doing. And so, you know, I, I try really hard as his friend and colleague to make sure that he's not going to look bad on camera. So I make right. sure that he knows exactly how to do things and whatnot. Cause you know, I, in the reverse, I wouldn't want to look stupid on camera either. Yeah. No. So, um, right. So, and originally the panic button was going to be, they were going to call me out and help whoever mm. hit the panic button. Well, well which would make sense fast. because you're, you're the one who right. actually made it. Exactly. So, but we figured out really quick while in production that that's not happening because I'm busting out four pieces. Cause all three of round one and the second, you know, the, the one big one in round two, yeah. I have to make all those. And you're, I don't you're, just get to make one of the three. I have to make all three. And you're so making, I'm making four pieces the day the before day, for okay. the next day's episode. Wow. Yeah, which is so much work. So yeah. So much work. Yeah. So much work. So um, we figured out that there's no way that I could like leave what I'm doing and get everything done in time and go out on set and be camera ready and blah, blah, blah. Right. So that got, that got strapped back. So instead, you know, Jacques or if our guest judge is a food person, they would, you know, they would, they'd help. Right. Um, they'd be the ones called when the panic button hits. Um, but, you know, back to how hard this show is for me to make and how much work it is. It is you know, a normal, a normal shoot day is 12, 12 hours. Wow. That's 12 hours on your feet. That's more than like most pastry chefs do anyway. Right. Um, but. And unlike, you know. It, we. It, not and not to diminish any other role on set, but if you're if you're a cameraman, you're not running the camera for twelve hours. You're sitting waiting for no. them. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like most of it is hurry up and wait, but you are on your feet twelve hours and you are you are getting your steps in. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm getting my junk done. So um and twelve hours, honestly, I don't there's been maybe two days in the thirty four episodes worth that we've done Yeah, that I remember I could actually get out of there at the 12 hour mark. It's been more like 14. There's been as many as 20 hours. Mm, wow. And, and that's because people have changed things. You know, they'll change the entire creative idea for an episode and we have to scrap everything and start over. Yep. Um, you know, because really I don't get a whole lot more time than the contestants do to get these things finished. Okay. And yeah, I mean, they, some of their times are pretty, pretty tight, but, um, you know, again, it's based on Pinterest and like your Instagram time-lapse videos where people think that you can bust this stuff out so fast. No. Well, it's not really the case, you know, um, when you see a gorgeous cake on Pinterest, right? let's say that cake probably took at minimum a week mm. for that artist. Yeah. And that is because like real quick, the process of making a cake in a week for like a Saturday delivery is you're baking Monday, Tuesday, you're making your frostings and filling Wednesday, you're splitting the cake, filling it, frosting it, you know, Thursday, you're scraping, putting fondant on it, starting to decorate it Friday, right. you're finishing decorating it and boxing it. And then it's off for delivery Saturday. Right. That's the process of a fresh cake being wow. made in a week. And that's how it happens. Nobody makes a cake and bakes it like that morning and no. gets it all ready to go and done. Well, even, by the even, even just the idea it of like happen. things having to cool, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, oh yeah. Right. That's <laughs> that the funniest think, part about the show. To, be like, um, cool the cake. And we have blast chillers, which is like, I don't have a blast chiller in my studio. Right. Cause I do custom, I do custom work only by appointment only. I don't do retail. Right. Retail is the kiss of death. <laughs> so I would own a black chiller. I mean, those things are crazy expensive and super expensive to run. Right. So, you know, I don't have that benefit. I have regular refrigerators. I don't freeze my cake. Yeah. Um, I, everything I do is very artisan and from scratch. And, um, I mean, I'm known for my cake taste, my flavors. Yeah. So not just what they look like on the outside because cake is food. It's supposed to be eaten. And, um, so that to me, you know, when people like gush and freak out over the flavor of my cake, that is actually more heartwarming to me than, Oh, your cake looks so cool. Right. Um, because cake was meant to be eaten. Yes. It's not just made to be looked at. Yes. So anyway, um, that's the other thing, a little side note too. It's kind of funny. I, 
I get so bothered by by chefs that get their panties in a wad and they're um, you know, they think they're all that and whatnot. I'm like, you know, we make food and food <laughs> goes in your mouth. Right. And then it comes out the other end. <laughs> and everybody's stuff comes out the other end. Right. And no matter how so beautiful, no matter how perfect. Pull your head out and stop thinking you're all that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it, you know, and it's not like, down it's not real. it's not downplaying or undervaluing the art that you're doing, but it, it's a healthy perspective. Like I I that's why I as a magician and a, as a comedian, like it kills me when I see people taking themselves so seriously. It's like you are not oh, wow. curing cancer. You are finding right. the queen of hearts. <laughs> calm right. down. Just calm down I a know. little bit. <laughs> it's so true. I know I crack up. I'm like, really, people, just because you're on TV, get get a clue. <laughs> anyway, so um, so yeah, so um, I I did go back second season, and I pushed really hard for a reveal. I'm like, you guys, it's not worth it to me if people don't know I'm doing this, right? And um, and so one of the executive producers um, uh, probably took pity on me because halfway through filming, I ended up in the hospital. Like the show, we wow. we joked that nailed it, almost killed me. I literally had to get taken out of my hotel room by four hot firefighters and two hot paramedics in Burbank and taken to the hospital. I was there for two and a half days. I begged and pleaded to, um, to, you know, to the doctors, please let me out. Like just Whoa. catch me up. Let me out. I've got another week of filming. Was this, this entire just, show is going to come to a screeching halt. Yeah. Was it just contestants exhaustion? Coming in. Contestants coming in. Oh, what, well, was it, it was, I had ovarian cancer. It's really, really Reader's Digest version. I had ovarian cancer twice in my 20s. Okay. I had a bunch of surgeries abdominally. So all that abdominal surgery stuff gave me scar tissue in my oh. small intestine. And ne- I had no idea. Terrible. No yeah. idea. 20 plus years ago. So I had no idea that I had it. Wow. Um, but being on my feet as long as I was yeah. and eating the food they feed you at, uh, you know, during a production, right. really heavy food and stuff like that. And so all of that plus the stress, it tanked me. Wow. So, um, yeah, so I, I came back for the second week of filming. My poor assistant was in tears, a puddle of tears every day because uh. she was having to kind of pick up the slack. Luckily I had enough stuff done beforehand so that she could kind of make it through. Plus the culinary producer, our sweet, sweet culinary producer, Kim Seeley. Yeah. Um, she, you know, she and my assistant, Katie, like got us through those, Luckily, we were dark one of those days. So it was like a day and a half that they had to keep pushing through. Wow. But I survived on, no joke, miso soup broth and body armor um, sports drink. Yeah. That's all I had. That's, all I, that's all I ingested for, for the, that whole second week. For the week. second shoot week. Wow. Yeah. That's all, I, that's all I lived on. And I was half dead. I was gray. I mean, it was awful. But, um, but the executive producer, I think, took pity on me. And so sh- she had... Um, you'll see in the Hanukkah episode from last holiday, the nail it holiday. Yeah. They come in and they, um, um, Nicole and Sylvia, another sweet friend of mine. Um, they, they come in back to my set. Cause I'm on a, a separate set next to the regular set. Okay. They come back into my set. Cause we like to peel the, the curtain back on this show, obviously where everybody knows Wes, our AD and, um, and a bunch of other, you know, crew people. Right. Um, they came back to my set and they gave me like six, seven seconds. Yeah. all. And I'm like, is that really? That's all? Wow. So this time, um, the Netflix people have said, oh, we're going to bring press in. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. You know, it has, has to get. But, um, and you, you, know, got, they, you guys are midway they, through? Or wh- where are you at in the production of this season? We're a third of the way through this time. Okay. We, we're, we're doing more episodes. And um, luckily, we're breaking it up. I actually have a day off today, which is incredible. But, um so we're breaking it up into like thirds as we're filming, but okay. it's still like six weeks worth of filming. I mean, it's, what is, it's no joke. And I'm away from my kids and yeah. luckily there's FaceTime and Venmo and um, my <laughs> kids are like older teenagers now. So they drive and, yep. and whatnot, but I do have to run home for one kid's um, high school graduation <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in two days from now. Oh my um, 
I know. I had to FaceTime my daughter's graduation. Um, she graduated from like a, a special school. She was like one of seven people graduating. Wow. And we weren't even sure she was going to graduate, but we, you know, she did. But I had to FaceTime um, at her graduation um, because that was our very first episode filming day and I couldn't wow. be gone. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you know, they're, they're mouths to feed and it's yep. a job and, you know, I'm busting my tail, but it's, you know, it's some money. I get and, it. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to feed my three kids. What, um, what do you think the hesitation anyway, has been with the reveal up until this point? I think, Is it, it's, I think it's because they're concerned that people will know that it takes me a little bit longer right. to make something spectacular that we're giving the contestants, you know, two hours to make. Right. Um, but you know, the whole, it's a comedy baking show. It is. We're not a serious baking show. Right. So it's, ho- it's hosted yeah, it's by a, a stand up comedian. <laughs> right. I know. Exactly. And just, Nicole's a just, she's delightful, but, um, yeah, it's a comedy baking show. So yes, right. I'm going to take a little bit longer. I don't have a lot longer than the contestants. Believe right. me. Right. Um, one of the reasons why, um, like literally word for word, when that producer called me about this show, he goes, look, he goes, the reason why I'm pitching you to them to, and he goes, you're my only phone call. It's just the only person I thought of, the only person I'm going to even ask. And I'm begging you to say yes. Wow. But he said, I know I can throw anything at you and you can do it. And that I don't have to have another producer back there with you, with your camera. Cause you tell, you can tell the camera what to get and what not to get right? and yeah. you know, how to get it. He's like, so, so if you're like a, you're like tag team role. And I still, to this day do that. I'm still like my own producer. Right. Um, but that's, that's an uncredited, and, that's an uncredited role, right? <laughs> you're not, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. Luckily at least for season two and stuff, I did get cake artist, food stylist, but, um, you know, they still, they still kind of refer to me as secret chef or, you know, my, my set in my area is charity land, but, um, mm-hmm. they, you know, they still are, they're still kind of dragging their feet on it, which is, I don't know, crazy to me. And it's, it's irritating too, that, you know, they have, they have Jacques voicing over what I'm doing. And so people think it's him. And right. again, he's a dear friend. I love him, but you know, it's, it's false advertising, if you will, that they're not showing that it's me. So it's a bummer, but I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work with Netflix and make sure that they are going to follow through with what they say they're going to follow through with. But, um, you know, here I've done, you know, 30 plus episodes. We're filming a whole bunch more right now and I can't get an agent. I cannot get an agent to email me back. Yeah, no, I swear to you. I've emailed, a dozen or so agents that people have like, you know, referred me to whatever. I can't get any of them to email me back. And I've even, I've I've said, I mean, this is what I do. This is who I am. This is, I have an IMDb profile for everything. Right. You know, it it shows everything I've got on there. With an insane amount of credits on it. I mean. Yeah, I know. I can't get, it's funny to me. I cannot get an agent to email me back. I know. It's nuts. But again, it's this business. It's, it's rank. It is. It's just, Oh, uh, it's frustrating, but I have a show treatment that I've come up with because I'm, um, something about me is two of my kids have medical challenges. We'll say, okay. Um, my daughter has leukemia. She's had it for 12 years and, um, and she's just managed on a daily chemo medication. Um, it's not cured. Wow. And my youngest has spondyloarthritis and Crohn's. So wow. he's on Humira shots and and whatnot but um gosh probably 10 years ago now i guess or eight nine somewhere in there maybe eight or nine years ago now um the you know, a, a dear sweet artist friend of mine um introduced me to a gal named tracy quisenberry who had started this nonprofit called yeah. icing smile yes. and she got like not even two sentences into her pitch to me when we got introduced um, because I'm a medical mom and a cake artist. And right. she told me that basically those are make a wish, make a wish of cake. Right. So we use um, over 10,000, what we call sugar angels, which are our volunteer uh, bakers all over the country. And when we get a request from a medical family um, for a cake for a, a medical, medically fragile or medically critical child, um, 
we match them up with a volunteer baker in the area and we um, have them volunteer their time and money and efforts and stuff. And they make a cake for a medical kid. And, um, and anyway, so we, you know, so we basically, we we make, you know, tens of thousands of cakes for kids that are, you know, that are in medical need. We do burn victims, you know, accident victims. We don't just do kids that are terminal or really, you know, uh, critically ill, like make a wish does. Right. We even do siblings. Okay. I mean, I know my poor kids know firsthand that when your kids, you know, you've got a kid in ICU yep. or living at a hospital for three plus months that, um, that, you know, the, the siblings get put aside and they and, get ignored. And it's a tough partially. position to be in because, you know, even if you're feeling like you're being put aside, you feel, you feel guilty to even bring that up or, you know what I mean? You, right. It's like, well, at least right. I'm not going through what they're going through. So exactly to give them a little reprieve is great birthday cakes right right so we we actually like say we're we're in the business of making memories because there's very few good memories to be had when you're in um when you're in uh crisis mode like that Mm. and you know when i when i see when i get to meet with these families and 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 do cakes for them and stuff like that i you know i see that gosh the hollow look in their eyes where they're just I have been there. I've been there. And, you know, we cry together and whatnot. But anyway, so I've, um, I've created a show, um, that I'm, you know, shopping around trying to get looked at. And yeah. it is based on our mission at I think smiles. It's more or less like extreme home makeover meets diners, drive and dive. So you get to like see the baker and see the process they go through to make this cake that the, the, the child is asked for, the family's asked for. And then you get the delivery at the end, yes. which, you know, the, the, I think TV these days is starting to catch on again Yep. that we need to get away from all this really awful, ugly, fake reality junk and get back to emotionally connecting with our viewers the way extreme home makeover used to do. It used to be in tears before they'd ever say, move that butt. Right. And oh, yeah. right. And it's a feel good, you know, happy stuff. I mean, I think that's why queer eye is doing so well too, is because, I mean, you're in tears part of the time watching Queer Eye because these boys are, and they're sweet, sweet boys. Oh my gosh, they're right. such dolls. It was fun to, to do our Queer Eye episode with them. Um, they, you know, they're they're opening up their hearts about the struggles they've had, you know, with these feelings and, and you know, realizing that they are different from other people, you know, that they have same-sex attraction and blah, blah, and like wading through that minefield right. in our society of trying to figure that out in their lives. And, you know, like Bobby with his um, religious background and stuff like that and how tough that was for him. So, you know, that show's doing great because we are mo- emotionally connecting with the show. Right. And, yep. and, you know, my show is the same thing. It would be such an emotional connection and, you know, you're making these kids so happy and giving them such a happy memory and exciting thing for them to cling to when life is so bad. You know, right. it's so awful. Yep. There's nothing like having a kid in ICU fighting for their life. I'm telling you right now. Yeah. I, can't I mean, nothing. It stinks. And, and, you know, it, it, it lightens everyone's heart when a cake is involved. The first one I ever did was for a little guy who was three and he had, um, he had a, a kidney transplant. Mm. Um, he'd been sick since birth and, um, and I didn't realize it till I got there and delivered his cake. Um, but he had never tasted birthday cake. He'd never, no. because of his, he, yes, was, he just wasn't able his, to, he wasn't able to. So <sighs> he was, he grabbed that, the chocolate treasure chest I had made as part of his cake. And he starts munching on the chocolate treasure chest and, he to this day, the kid is, gosh, twelve now. Yeah. He to this day talks about that kid. <laughs> oh my god! It's so goodness. cute. Yeah, and I stay in touch with all my families that I've made cakes for. I feel like they're, you know, I'm I'm part of their world now, and it's just the sweetest experience. And any sugar angel will tell you they are. It's their favorite favorite deliveries is to do an icing smiles cake. Yep. It's just such a lovely organization. I'm actually president of the board now. Um for the organization and stuff. And so it's, it's just such a great organization to be part of, but it's a really cool show. And, yeah. you know, I, I, 
we'd make sure we were not, you know, getting too awful and, and horrible. And, you know, cause it's a, it's a, uh, it's a careful thing to not get depressing, right. you know, yeah. when it, when you do stuff like that. And I think extreme home makeover did a really beautiful job. Yep you know, telling the family's story without getting depressing. Right. Right. Um, right. You really have to lean on the hope side of things, you know? Right. Exactly. But anyway, so, I mean, I can't, you know, I haven't gotten any like really hard bites on, on the show treatment, but you know, it takes years to get well, one of those we've things gotta, made. But. We've got to figure this out. There's enough people listening to this who know agents. Let's, let's get this done. Let's I'm dead serious. Oh it would be so rad. And what a great opportunity. It would be so rad. I mean, what a great opportunity too with a show like that, because not only is it, you know, bringing enjoyment to people, but it's also reminding everybody that whatever your talent is or your gift, however unique or niche, you can use that to make a difference and help other people. True. It is so, so true. And with, you know, with the streaming services, Netflix and Amazon and stuff like that, there's so many other outlets now to get cool shows made. Right. That's not just, yeah, you know, the regular networks and right. cable and whatnot. So it's really it's it's a cool time to have you know awesome show ideas yep. and get them made. But it's still very you know it's very political. It's hard. It's a hard thing to do. Yeah, yeah. In- so, but yeah, you know, I love an agent. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, to, like do my own contract negotiations and oh my and, goodness, charity. <laughs> I know it's off. I have a lawyer. I do have a lawyer. Oh, good. But, That's yeah, good. It's, the agent part is yeah. I, I need to fill that gap. Wow. Well, we friends, if you're listening to this, send us a message. Let's figure it out. Let's get it done. <laughs> charity how, thank you very much yeah i mean apart from watching watching the show that you're working on how can people see what you're doing follow along the journey do you do the social media um, thing or your website what's the yo, best way yeah. for people to reach out yeah i'm 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 so bad at the, the social media stuff i apologize i probably post more about my orange theory workouts and my calorie burn than i do <laughs> much about cake because i mean half the time i'm making cake for tv and i can't post it until it until it until airs, it airs. So that's a bummer that's right but um yeah but i'm at um on instagram i'm at sugar charity great all one word and um my website is chef charity.com really easy chef charity.com that's awesome and of course i'm on facebook you can find me on facebook and twitter and all that stuff but if you you know if you find instagram you should be able to find everything else so that is so awesome. I am so delighted with our talk today, and I'm very, very excited for what's next for you. I, I just feel like, uh, I mean, I know you've got a lot going on right now, but it's at one of those moments where you just feel like something big's about to happen. So thank you for letting us talk now, and we're going to have to do another episode, you know, a year from now and see where things are at and what, what all is happening. It'd be awesome. When I have an agent? <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> when I have an agent. <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to... We're getting, we're getting further. We're going to do it. Thank you so much, though, for having me, Taylor. Uh, it was just a delight. Oh, we're going to... Let's keep talking for a minute. I'm going to turn off this recorder because we're going to talk about this agent thing. <laughs> okay. Friends, go follow Charity. <laughs>